And I think that part of the problem is that people don't really understand what communism is. This revolution now, of course, is entering the very sanctuary of God, the holy sacrifice of Christ, paganism. Yep. I mean, this is, this is really an abomination. So, oh, and by the way, you're a racist if you stand against this particular right. So we have to remain and resist. And we have to resist the changes that they're trying to impose. And these changes are coming from the top. Our Lady was clearly drawing our attention to communism. Russia has been chosen as an instrument, either of chastisement or of mercy. That is, only the Blessed Virgin can help us. Praise be Jesus and Mary. I'm David Rodriguez, Content Director of the Fatima Center, joined today by Michael Hitchborn of the Lepanto Institute. Michael, welcome back to the Fatima Center. Thanks so much for having me back on. It's good to have you. Many of you may recall he's spoken at our conference, I think it was last year in Dallas, mm -hmm. and um, at another smaller conference we had near where you live in Virginia. Great talk there. If you haven't seen it, by the way, he talked about the, uh, it was the, the construction of a false church. Oh, right, yeah. It was the main theme. And so it's a, it's a very good talk, quite timely, in fact, um, boy, I'm already getting off topic. I just saw this news flash come up across my computer that uh, the Vatican has just approved the Mayan rite, a new Mayan yep. rite. Have you seen that already? I, I already saw it. I read the article and and it's uh, it's beginning. It, it's talk beginning. about constructing a false church, bringing in yeah. paganism into the very sacrifice of Christ, formalizing it, institutionalizing it. It's yeah, it's pretty insane. So. Let's, before we dive in, just uh, do a proper introduction. For those of you who may not know Michael, uh, he is married. He and his wife, Alyssa, have eight children, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay, it's not nine. Okay. All right. Because sometimes those numbers jump on us. Okay. Eight children. <laughs> he does have- Could always grow. Hmm? Could always grow. There you go. Uh, he's got a bachelor's of arts. He has a bachelor's of arts degree from Christian College in political science and economics, a master's degree in education from the American Intercontinental University. Worked for many years as American Life League's director of the Defend the Faith. Uh, and nowadays, he is the founder and really operates the Lepanto Institute for the Restoration of All Things in Christ. It is a research and educational organization dedicated to the, the defense of the Catholic Church against assaults from without and within, whether in the form of armies, heretics, or traitors. The church is always facing these enemies, seeking her destruction, Today, the church faces all three. And that's precisely why we have you on, to talk about one of these enemies, specifically communism. Uh, our latest issue of the Fatima Crusader is highlighting communism as one of the main errors of Russia that Our Lady warned about. We've got a lot of different articles here. And while uh, I was uh, too late in soliciting an article from Michael, otherwise he might have been one of our authors here as well, uh, he can certainly speak to the topic because he has a vast amount of experience on this. So we'll dive right in. Let's say, a, let's say a prayer, one of the Fatima prayers, Michael, and then we'll begin. You bet. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. My God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love thee. I ask pardon for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, and do not love thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. amen. So in the, I wrote the letter to the editor for the magazine, Michael, and in it, I basically make the argument that communism spread itself everywhere in the world, even though many don't necessarily know it, because oftentimes it's coming under different names and under different forms than just, you know, red menace of communism. Um, is this something in your experience you could agree with? Why? Why not? Absolutely. And I think that part of the problem is that people don't really understand what communism is. They, they think that communism is merely an economic system where, you know, you're, you're collecting all of the income from, a, from the government and the, the people of a, of a nation and putting it into one big giant coffer. Nobody owns anything privately and they just kind of redistribute the wealth. They think that that's an economic principle that is the, uh, the guiding impetus behind communism, but that's not really it. Communism, properly defined, is a perpetual revolution uh, that takes place between those who are in power versus those who are oppressed by the power. So it's always moving 
so that you have, you know, the people who are currently in power, whether it's a monarchy or a republic or a democracy or some other form of government, those who are in power are the ones who are oppressing you. And they are going to continue oppressing you and you have to pick whatever it is that they're oppressing you with, whether it's uh, a religious persecution or a persecution of workers or a persecution of sexual minorities or a racial persecution, whatever it is, they'll find something within the culture to glom onto. And they say, this is the essence of our, uh, our fight. So we have to fight and, and maintain this fight against that. We have to re revolt and rebel against it. Uh, we'll do it through the courts, but if we have to, we'll do it with violent means. So they will fight that revolution until they gain power. Well, what happens when they gain power? Well, now they start oppressing the people that had oppressed them. And then you have to build that base of, of fight for the people who are now currently oppressed the former leaders, so that they can rise up and have another re revolution. So the word revolution means it's to revolve around. So you always start at one point, you go around it until you come back up to the top and now you've made one revolution. So the idea of revolution is a perpetual change of power so that the focus of man is no longer on salvation. It's no longer on uh, love of neighbor. It's, it's actually predicated on hatred of neighbor, because if you're not part of our tribe, if you're not part of our struggle, well, you are the hater and we must also hate you. So it's, it's hatred for neighbor, it's hatred for leadership, and it's hatred for souls because it's all predicated on political power. So these revolutions, which is the nature of communism, communi the word communism, is uh, it, it's a misnomer um, because it's it's all pre it's all based on Karl Marx's idea of the collective state. But what he was really writing about was this perpetual revolution, and that's that's the essence of communism. So th that's the reason why people do not properly understand or identify it in today's world. When they look around, they're looking for people waving hammer and sickle flags or parading in the streets carrying Karl Marx signs you know, Karl Marx images. And those are the people that they associate with communism without understanding that it's revolutionism. The French Revolution was the blueprint for the Soviet Revolution. It laid the foundation and it, 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 it <laughs> again, it all goes back really to the secret societies, to Freemasons, to the Rosicrucians, to all those various secret orders that have enlightenment thinking. So if you want to understand Karl Marx's uh, Communist Manifesto, you've got to read Hegel. You've got to read Nietzsche. You've got to, you know, you have to read these enlightenment thinkers. And from there, you can understand what the revolution is about. And it's all about waging a perpetual war against Holy Mother Church. Well, there you have it. Thank you for that excellent synopsis. Um, I think one way that I would summarize some of what you were saying, at least at the beginning, is the communists, well, the, their theory is always going to be to split people up into groups. We could call them the haves and the have-nots, right? Yep. And then they want to incite the have-nots to anger and to revolution against the haves. And so they're always trying to find ways to uh, get people against each other, to set them up by playing on on a lot of base human you know, uh, sinful conditions like envy or, or greed or just feeling like I'm the victim. And so you create victims and oppressors, the haves and the have nots, and you set them at odds against each other. So as to further, ultimately, I guess, if you're an instigator, further your own ends, um, because as you say, even though the revolution is continuous, once the revolters get to the top, uh, they'll do a massive purging. So they get mm -hmm. rid of everyone whom they think could actually oppose them. And even on the lower classes, they'll eliminate anyone there because they try to then hold on to that power just as tightly as they can, which is, I think, that other element of communism. Um, so I thought it was really interesting because as I was as I was just saying right now, the haves and the have nots and setting themselves up against each other. I immediately thought of what we just said when we opened up, right, this new thing that just hit my computer today, that mm. we're creating this Mayan right in the church. Here again is an example of haves and have-nots. 
You know, there's this right that is, you know, Latin or Roman or European or white. You know, you can put whatever category you want on it. And then you say these indigenous Mayan, they have their own ideas or that they have nots and they've been oppressed for centuries. So now we create this revolution. Uh, and yet this revolution now, of course, is entering the very sanctuary of God, the holy sacrifice of Christ, paganism entering yep. the sacrifice. I mean, this is this is really an abomination. So. Oh, and by the way, you're a racist if you stand against this particular right. There you go. The victims and the, and, and so uh, in part, I guess I've answered my question, but I'll let you elaborate because in maintaining that communism is ubiquitous under these ver various different forms and names that it has, uh, I would also argue that's entered into the church. I guess I just gave one example of that. Um, in decades past, the church was, of course, this great bulwark against communism, mm -hmm. but um, it seems like that has gone by the wayside. And uh, certainly Our Lady warned this at Fatima, but do you see signs? I know you've done a lot of research, especially you know, the corruption in the church, follow the money, things of mm -hmm. that sort. Uh, do you see signs of communism being you know, really present and influencing and affecting, infecting the church? Without a doubt. In fact, uh, liberation theology was created by the KGB. Uh, it was created by the KGB, invented by the KGB in Romania. Uh, they used Romania because it was the only Latin based uh, country in all of the Eastern Bloc. So they were, they were testing it, they were developing it and they, they, they put it together there in Romania. And then they went to South America and they sold the idea of liberation theology to the Jesuits down there. And it was through the Jesuits that they were able to spread this idea of liberation theology, which became the religious foundation for communist revolution all over South America. So that is one instance of an infiltration of, of communism into the Catholic Church. But we also know that uh, in the 1950s, the common turn came up with, or the, the disinturn came up with a... Uh, a, a false seminary where they were recruiting former priests and former seminarians to come to their Marxist seminary where they would gain a degree in theology. And then the, the KGB would then inject these uh, various Marxist communist trained priests to go into Catholic parishes, to go into Catholic communities, posing as priests when they were not, wow. and they would then start to spread their communist errors that way. We know that because I, I, it was in, uh, I think, 1954 or 1955, the Vatican radio put out a broadcast specifically warning about this particular seminary that was created by the communists. Uh, we know that in the 1960s, uh, when the Second Vatican Council was taking place, one of the documents, one of the very last documents that was created by the council is, uh, I, I'm trying to remember the name of the document. It's, it's the one that's, that has to do with the re restructuring of religious institutions. Um, and uh, in that document, it, it specifically stated that these religious orders have to now start taking an interest in social justice. Well, it's interesting that shortly after when they started implementing that aspect of the Second Vatican Council, they doffed the habit. They got rid of the habit. They changed their habits so that it was just for women. It was it was like a pantsuit or, or like a maxi skirt and a little pin to indicate that they're part of a religious order. But then they got really involved in social justice. And, and there are all sorts of examples of women who, while maintaining a semblance of being a part of a religious institution, were engaged in race riots and they were going out and, and marching for LGBT rights. And in the 1970s, you had, uh, I think it was 1979 when Pope John Paul II came to the United States and the head of the women's, uh, the, what was it? The uh, major superiors for women religious. Uh, she gave a five minute presentation asking the Holy Father to reconsider allowing women to become priests. So they are pushing this revolutionary idea within the church. They're Marxists. They are 
communists they, they, in, in the revolutionary sense. They're saying, we don't have the ability to be priests, but we want the ability to be priests. So we're going to ro- you know, have a revolt, have a revolution to push for this idea, which is why we keep seeing it come up over and over and over within the church, even till now they're, they're pushing for this idea of women deacons. Why? Because it's a stepping stone to women priests. So it's, it's happening in the church. There's no doubt that it's happening in the church. We see it with the Catholic Campaign for Human Development, which was created specifically to finance Saul Alinsky's community organizing groups. Saul Alinsky was a Marxist. He was never officially a member of the Communist Party, but everything that he wrote in Rules for Radicals and Reveille for Radicals was very, very much in line with communist thinking, and it was all predicated on revolutionism, this push for gaining power for the have-nots to rise against the haves. That's what it's all about. So yes, the Catholic Church has most certainly been infiltrated by Marxists and there is a push to remake the church in the form of a Marxist church. Uh, but, you know, we can recognize it for what it is just by matching it up with what the church has always said and done over the last 2,000 years. And anything that goes off the path, discard it. Good advice. I think that document might have been Perfecte Caritatis. That's it. Yeah. Yep. Um, and as you were speaking, I even thought about how there was that one famous incident, I think it was at the Denver World Youth Day, where our Lord was portrayed in the Stations of the Cross. I said betrayed, maybe that's the right word, in the Stations of the Cross with, I think it was a woman acting as our Lord and, you know, Mother Angelica, VW10, so she sort of lost it and said, you know, Mm -hmm. this really is crazy. You see again that uh, communist infiltration, even at this world stage level of church events, um, I'm glad you also mentioned the whole kind of LGBTQ alphabet soup uh, ideology, because that's also, I think, where I have seen a particular cultural Marxism really seeping into the church and, and just taking over um, and leaving utter destruction in its wake. And of course, anyone who doesn't agree uh, is being canceled. And again, it's the haves versus the have nots, these false dichotomies and false antagonisms set up. That are completely against charity because ultimately charity right, to really love your neighbor means to desire their good so that they'll go to heaven which means you want to keep right. them out of a state of sin you want them to uh be filled with sanctifying and actual graces so uh i guess um what what are the any any advice you can have or suggestions you can have because you, you even mentioned i think cchd i don't know if crs has been involved in this or anything else you should warn catholics about other advice you might give them on what they can do to try to resist this onslaught, especially of communism within within the church. Sure. So we have to remember that anything that that uh, goes against church teaching really does touch upon the idea of it. Well, it does touch upon the uh, cultural Marxism that you just mentioned, because what it does is it's you have to remember cultural Marxism is a it's a means to an end. And the means that it implements is the de- the demoralization of those who are part of a system. And so what uh, Gramsci said was that if we want to capture the men, we have to make women fall. And, and what is he doing? He's actually following the example of the, the Garden of Eden. You know, the serpent didn't go to Adam. The serpent went to Eve. He corrupted Eve first so that the, he could then corrupt Adam. So Gramsci decided, well, if if we were going to corrupt the morals of the men, we have to first corrupt the morals of the women. So go into Catholic colleges and start instituting co-ed colleges. And let's promote this idea of men and women going to university together where they are not going to be monitored by their parents and they're not going to be, uh, you're not going to have people making sure that they're, you know, not going off somewhere together in the quiet, dark alley, you know. And Eventually, what he also said is that they should they should have parties, and at these parties, we'll introduce marijuana. We'll make sure that they're having uh, all kinds of alcohol, so that their their inhibitions will be greatly diminished, and then they will fall into uh, habitual sin with their boyfriends and and whatnot. And the corruption of the girls will lead to the corruption of the men. 
the introduction of that kind of corruption will eventually push for the introduction of contraception because, well, now that you've got loose morals, you have to prevent the consequences of the, that loose morality. And then, of course, abortion is the consequence of that. So cultural Marxism, when it comes to the LGBT community, is the logical end step of this whole process of demoralizing the people who are in the church. When you have people in the hierarchy of the church suddenly elevating and applauding these, these members of that particular community, well, what you wind up doing is telling people that morality has shifted. You've, you, you're making them at least believe in a practical way that the church no longer really believes what she has once preached and that now the morality of the church is somehow different. And that pushes away the people who are strong in the faith or should be, and it opens the way for more corruption. And that progress that, the, that they're trying to have in the church really isn't about uh, destroying the church, because I think the, the revolutionaries really know ultimately they can't destroy the church, but they can certainly stop any kind of uh, pushback. Uh, Stalin recognized that the best way to fight against the, the, uh, the, the, the people who didn't want communism, to push back against the conservative elements of the world, was first to corrupt the church because the church stood as the bulwark against the philosophy and the, uh, the political march of communism. If the church is no longer in the way, well, there's really nothing to, to resist. There's nobody that, that's left. So the church stands as that bulwark. Now, uh, I, I'm trying to remember the rest of the question. You had some other element to the question. I'm, I, I've lost that part. Yeah, no, sure. I'll bring that right back up. But on, on that point, it's, it's very interesting because I think we make the point in the magazine that in some ways, or maybe in some of the articles we're posting on the website, communism is almost like an anti-church. That it yes. has sort of that universal element. It wants to take over everyone. It wants it to create its own classless and stateless and universal hegemony, this new world order, if you will. And ultimately, that's what only Christ the King does, of course, through charity and through his goodness and his mercy, whereas they do it, you know, through lies, deceit, at the point of guns and bombs, et cetera. So it really is a kind of anti-church. And also, you mentioned, I just want people to make sure if you want to study more on the Frankfurt School, um, when, when he was mentioning cultural Marxism, uh, Michael was and Gramsci, he's one of the founders of the Frankfurt School in the magazine. There is an article on that. And we actually have a much lengthier article online on the Frankfurt School. So you just go to our website and type in the Frankfurt School. You're going to learn a lot more about this cultural Marxism and these ideas that Michael was just expressing how they sought specifically to attack the morals. Uh, and that's another element, I think, of communism that people very often forget, the undermining of morals is a sort of indispensable uh, go-to tactic of the communists. Yeah, I mean, the last question to close and maybe any other comments you might have, but it was just if there's anything you might, any concrete things you could recommend to individuals right. who want to be aware of this and resist it and you know hold on to the faith. You've already given us some though. Well, ultimately we have to remember the, the as I mentioned, the march of Marxism within the church is not predicated on the idea that they're going to destroy the church. They want to push people out. So we have to remain and resist. And we have to resist the changes that they're trying to impose. And these changes are coming from the top. And, and that's something we absolutely have to recognize. One of the very first things that Pope Francis did when he became Pope Francis was to align himself with the United Nations and promise to put the full weight and force of the, of the Catholic Church behind the United Nations effort for the Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals fall right in line with the planks of communism. They are uh, designed and developed so that they implement what the communists have been trying to implement for the last 100 years. Uh, we did a big article on this a couple of years ago at Lepanto Institute's website uh, asking the question, why did Pope Francis, uh, why does Pope Francis support these communist goals? And I don't have the answer to that, but we go through and we analyze the goals themselves and we show these are absolutely communist goals. There's no doubt about it. The Catholic Church, uh, through Caritas Internationalis and Catholic Relief Services and various other agent, you know, aid and development agencies of the Catholic Church, 
are directly involved with something called the World Social Forum. And the World Social Forum is an international communist organization. Now, we have to remember the Hegelian dialectic here, and uh, thesis plus antithesis equals synthesis. And with the World Social Forum being the communist element, it was created in response to the World Economic Forum, which is the positive side. It's supposed to be the, the capitalists of the world, but they're also Marxists. And Pope Francis is playing on both sides. You've got Caritas Internationalis being directly involved and deeply involved with the World Social Forum. And then you've got Vatican members participating with the World Economic Forum and Pope Francis celebrating and applauding their efforts for whatever the international effort is. Oddly enough, the World Economic Forum over here is pushing this idea of the Great Global Reset. And then the World Social Forum is pushing for something of a very similar nature. They're just looking at a different way of getting it done. So it's that synthesis that they're trying to accomplish. And with the Vatican on both sides of that issue, the Vatican is trying to orchestrate that synthesis. And that's what we really and truly have to be aware of. It's not right for us to, to say, okay, well, there's the communist side because they're walking around with hammer and sickle flags and then join the exact opposite. Because many times the ones who set themselves up in direct opposition and they, they have very similar ideologies only from a different perspective, they're trying to ramrod the same, it's a pincher move. So we have to avoid that pincher movement. What we have to hold on to is exactly what the church has always taught. We should be doing exactly what Our Lady asked us to do. Pray the rosary daily, wear the brown scapular, make the first five, the five first Saturdays. And I would add to that, do exactly what our Lord said to Sister Lucia. Because uh, at the, um, the vision that, that Sister Lucia had, the angel pointing the flaming sword at the earth cried out in a loud voice, penance, penance, penance. And our Lord said to her, the penance that I now request is that each live according to their vocations. In other words, if you're going to be a priest, be a priest. Don't be a social activist. Don't be a slob. Don't be one of the guys. Be a priest. If you're going to be a nun, be a nun in the full sense. Don't walk around in this little maxi skirt and a cute little coat and, and try and uh, be this soft granny to everybody. No, you gave your life as a sacrifice for Christ and for the greater good of the entire church. Live it. And for those of us who are married, Love your wives, love your husbands, raise children, raise them with the idea that we are all going to die someday and that at the end of our lives, we are held accountable for our own souls and the souls of those that God gives us. So if we live according to our vocations, well, guess what kind of world we're going to have? A beautiful Catholic world. So that's the penance that he requests of us. And it requires sacrifice. The very nature of penance means to suffer for others or suffer for a good. So we have to sacrifice. We have to suffer for the good in the respect of our vocations. Just live it. That's that's the best advice that I could possibly give. Well, thank you. You've touched on all the elements of the Fatima message. You know, we often summarize it by saying conversion, reparation, and consecration. This is Our Lady's message. And we are at this point in this crisis. I do hope everyone realizes that communism is not going to step away until Russia is properly consecrated, as Our Lady has requested, commanded at Fatima. Every time that people pray the rosary, like in Austria in the 50s or in Brazil in the 60s, uh, that's when communism is repelled. So yes, we need to pray our rosary, as you said. We need to pray for Russia's consecration, consecrate yourself to the Immaculate Heart, wear that brown scapular, offer your prayer and penance, especially your daily, daily duty, as you so eloquently said. Do the first five. Do the five first Saturdays. Do the first Saturday all the time, not just five, but continue with it. Um, no, thanks a lot, Michael. Uh, really appreciate your joining with us. Any parting words? Uh, thanks so much for having me back on. And uh, I would just ask for your audience to pray for us and uh, just know that we continue to pray for you. We'll do that. We'll pray right now. I'll close with Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us.
In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us, Michael. Just a reminder to everyone, do get your Crusader. And uh, please like this video, share it with others, subscribe to our channel, and uh, check out the podcast, everything else we have at the website. And then Michael's uh, site is also, you want to tell to us, Lepanto Institute. What's the website for that? It's Lepanto I-N, so you can see it right here, L-E-P-A-N-T-O-I-N dot O-R-G. You got that really good with the finger there. You've yeah. nailed it right, <laughs> right where they were. I was, I was impressive. All right. God bless you. Have, have a great weekend, Michael. Thanks so much. God bless you and your audience.